Welcome to my first talk on how to become an expert medical legal consultant. Um, as always, please hit like and subscribe. So this is the first of three potential talks that I want to give on how to get into the field of expert legal consulting. As you're going through your residency and your fellowship, people just don't talk about how to get into this field. I think it's super interesting and hopefully this talk you'll find useful. So we're going to discuss the benefits to consulting that aren't immediately apparent, how to start in the field and make connections, how to structure the business, and then some recommendations on chart review, providing feedback. And my last talk is just specifically with uh, the deposition process. So how to get started. So it, it's hard to get started in this field straight out of your residency or your fellowship. Most practices are looking for people who are thought leaders in their field or have a lot of clinical experience. So, you know, I, it's, I was lucky where I got started a little bit earlier, and we'll talk about how I got that opportunity. Um, but, you know, um, if you are full-time retired, if you're mostly research-based, um, you're not going to be uh, often asked to do legal consulting because you're going to be looked at as out of touch clinically. Uh, so this is something that uh, is is more for the full-time provider. Um, getting started in this field is difficult because people just don't want to talk about it. And I think that some people feel that uh, there's some scarcity here and they don't want to um, give away or share their cases. I think that there's some uh, maybe some shame that comes with this, that you're part of this process that carries a lot of emotions. But I think that this is super exciting work um, and we'll talk about some of the benefits that aren't uh, immediately apparent. Um, so one of the ways that you can get started is is to create a network, right? So most law practices have a couple people that they kind of turn to for their cases, and they're not, not interested in people asking them if they're looking for new consultants. So um, I don't think solicitation of law practices is going to get you very far. Um, if you are in a larger group, you know, 20, 30, 40 providers, uh, I'm sure if you asked some of the older providers if they did this, a lot of them will say yes, right? And so some of them may be looking to step back or if they're closer to retirement where they're not going to be able to provide uh, this service anymore because they're not uh, clinically active, they may be willing to pass off uh, the cases to you or uh, to pass your name off to the attorneys that they're working with. Uh, so that certainly happened with uh, physicians from my last group. And then if you're a non-invasive cardiologist like myself, you're going to create relationships with other providers within your group. So I have an interventional provider, an EP provider, a pulmonary critical care physician. And if there are specific questions for their field uh, that does not pertain to general cardiology, such as complications during a procedure or maybe event management or critical care management, I will refer those questions to other providers in my network and uh, they'll do the same uh, with me, vice versa. So uh, having a network of physicians that you can lean on or ask, uh, ask questions to is, is also important because sometimes you don't know the answer. Or sometimes there may be a gray area between non-invasive cardiology and invasive cardiology. So some of the things that I didn't uh, immediately uh, know about is that this changes the way that you document. It, it You can't help but become better at documentation. So I specifically talk about the risks and benefits of different procedures, and I state them. You know, we talked about, um, you know, aggressive medical therapy for the results of the COURAGE or the ischemia trial. We talked about the risks and benefits of left heart catheterization. The patient wants to proceed with left heart catheterization. So going through these cases makes you a better physician in terms of your documentation. Um, oftentimes when these cases uh, come up, the plaintiff's attorney uh, who's representing the patient or the family of the patient who may have passed, often sues every single person in the hospital. So from the ER doctor to the ER nurse, to the internal medicine doctor, to the cardiologist, intensive guest. So everybody is named in the suit. And the idea is that maybe some people are going to start, you know, pointing fingers at each other and start to push other people under the bus. Um, so this is an opportunity for you to get uh, providers off of the case who were following standard of care. And so you can go through and say, yes, this one person may have made an error, but all these other people uh, did their job appropriately. So that, that's a good feeling. Um, you know, we have difficulty staying up to date sometimes with our reading, right? So 
this is a job that pays you to do research. So, you know, one of my first cases involved a trans esophageal echocardiogram that went awry and had an esophageal perforation, which is super uncommon in the order of one in 5,000. So to be able to review the literature on how often this occurs, what are the risk factors, uh, was useful because that's, you know, some of these rare uh, outcomes you often don't know as much about until you get into the weeds. Um, so, and, and then also just you, you stay pretty up to date with the guidelines uh, as well because oftentimes that's considered more of the standard of care. Um, you know, you get brief insights also into other hospitalizations and how they operate. So, you, you know, you, we may be at, I've been at two different hospital systems in my career, um, but uh, we don't often get exposure to dozens of different hospital systems. So seeing how different systems operate, how do they activate their cath lab, uh, what's the organization uh, within the ER setting, I think that's been use, uh, useful uh, as well. And then lastly, um, this is super important, is, is how do the system issues influence care? So for instance, you know, frequently these cases arise because it happened at two in the morning, or somebody missed a verbal handoff, or somebody didn't show up in time, or there was a lab error, or the lab machine was not working, right? So there was critical points along the way where the system broke down and left the physician exposed. Um, and so, you know, when I, I, I'm a lot more careful on how I do handouts now, um, and I'm a lot more aggressive uh, when it comes to ordering things stat, especially in the emergency room, because I want the results to come back in a timely manner, and I don't want us to be uh, late in responding to something because, because of that. Um, yeah, and I also uh, do both verbal and email handouts now uh, when I'm signing off services, uh, when I'm coming in or, not, or off of the, the inpatient service. So, you know, um, you want to get all your ducks in a row, right? So make sure that your CV is up to date. Um, and specifically, they want to know your board certifications and the level of board certification. So for instance, I'm board certified in echocardiography, but I'm level three in echo. I'm level two in nuclear, right? So um, they want to know those different uh, gradations. Um, all, of course, all of your publications uh, and your membership to national organizations is important as well. Um, make sure your LinkedIn profile is up to date and it matches your CV. I think, uh, you know, when I go and look up some of the other expert legal consultants who might be on a case, I see that uh, um, nothing's been updated for five or 10 years. And then consider a freestanding website if you're doing enough business where um, you want to have a presence online so that uh, people can go to that website and see what you're all about more so than just a, a LinkedIn page. So make sure that it's, it's uh, cardiology legal consulting specific. So, you know, when I was first starting out, I, I did not know how to start a business, right? So um, oftentimes, uh, a lot of the physicians that I talk to who do this, we've created LLCs called limited liability corporations, because if for whatever reason we were to be sued, they can't go after your net worth. They can only go after business assets. So it creates a legal shell around you. And it also uh, allows you to create something called an employee identification number. Now this is uh, in, as opposed to your social security number. So this is your employee tax ID number and allows you to put all of your income through your legal consulting business, uh, uh, all your legal income through the business, okay? So our federal tax rates are often really high because we're physicians and luckily we make decent money, but the LLC tax rates are often much lower. So I'm not a tax expert. You need to talk to your accountant, but um, I know that at least for my family, um, it, it's a financial benefit to have uh, the money go through that LLC. Each state is different. In Michigan, it was very easy to create an LLC. In the state of New York, it's very difficult to create an LLC. So I used a company called Zen Business uh, to create my LLC for me. It was worth, uh, I don't know, I think it was like six or $700, much cheaper in most states uh, that don't have uh, the regulatory hurdles uh, like the state of New York has. Um, yeah, and then this is the, um, uh, the EIN number, or the employee identification number. This is what you're going to put on your W-4 instead of your Social Security number uh, because you want all that income going through uh, the business account. Now, sometimes we're named in lawsuits uh, or we have to do depositions maybe on cases where we are not the defendant. So that happened to me earlier in my career where, uh, unfortunately, I had to run a code. It was my first call night, and I had to run a code 
uh, for this this gentleman, and um, unfortunately he passed, and and the family sued the hospital and all the other physicians except me, just because I, I think I was the last one to to kind of come in, and um, I was talking with the family, so you know their their case was very convoluted. They had I, I there there wasn't logical reasoning behind it, and so. I was able to memorize all the times and dates and the results of the testing uh, and uh, basically show that their case uh, was not very good. And uh, our hospital attorney uh, liked my responses. And so uh, since that time, we've been working together. So even though I wasn't a defendant, I was able to show uh, that I have a good memory, right? I can memorize a ton of facts uh, and uh, results and and use it to my advantage um, and think on my feet uh, while being interviewed. Um, and then that attorney has recommended me to other attorneys, right? And so, so once you get into the kind of the network, um, uh, oftentimes it's word of mouth. Um, other physicians will hear, or sorry, other attorneys will hear about you and often you'll get more work uh, because of that. So be sure to check out my next talk is prepping for your first case. I hope you enjoyed the talk and as always, please uh, click like and subscribe.